Chapter 8 The prince stared at the tactical display as the fleet moved in unison in a direction that best eluded the twelve opposing ships, trying to remain as far away from their weapons' effective range as possible. While they had the numerical and strength advantage, he wasn't willing to take his chances so brazenly. The principality's usual tactic to engage head-on when possessing an overwhelming advantage had gained it many victories and dozens of humiliating defeats in its history. The information the ship I sent as a scout and what Lieutenant Wyatt told us about Gintrax correlates, except for this ship, he said, pointing at the largest dot in the map. A battlecruiser. Princess Clara stood next to her brother while Cynthia silently watched over her from a few feet behind her. The princess narrowed her eyes and turned to her brother. They knew we were coming this way? There were no intercepted transmissions originating from Faldo, so they were not warned of our coming. That battlecruiser must have been dispatched here just in case we took this route. The other ships are corvettes and a few gunships, outdated and in dire need of being refitted. Wyatt's information was correct, the prince said, eyes narrowing. They must know they can't win, and yet they are shadowing our movements, Clara pointed out. Are there any other vessels in the system? Dozens upon dozens. All of them are civilian grade. Freighters, haulers, shuttles, and defense gunships, the prince answered, pointing with a finger at the map and the several dozen dots moving to a large station partially masked by a moon. That must be Woodshaft. My liege, Cynthia spoke up. Should we conscript the civilian ships for this fight? The prince shook his head gently. I will not allow this conflict to evolve into a civil war, Cynthia. The fact that the enemy fleet has not issued demands or orders to the civilian ships means they are following similar protocols. He clenched his fists bitterly. Duke Draymore wishes to eliminate or capture me as swiftly as possible to end this succession dispute in his favor. Wise of him. I still don't understand why our uncle is doing this. He never showed any real interest in the throne, nor was he outspoken against our father, his brother. What changed? What of our cousins? Have they sided with our uncle? Or do they see his coup for the madness it is? She closed her eyes for a moment, then snapped them back open with determination. I don't want to harm Gabriel or Veronica, brother. Neither do I, Clara. But for whatever reason our uncle has come to this move, we can't allow him to succeed. He has committed treason. Two years, Clara. He had been preparing for two years, possibly much longer than that, and we never suspected a thing until discrepancies in his financial and material reports were uncovered. He is a traitor, Clara, and like a traitor, he shall be severely punished alongside his conspirators. What about Duchess Emerald of Trinar and Duke Ionati of Vault? Clara asked, hopeful. You rarely keep me updated with the ongoing political turmoil, brother dearest. The information we receive is scattered and fragmented. The whole principality is in chaos and disruptions are commonplace. Almost the entire principality is now aware of the coup attempt. Duke Draymore has lost the element of surprise and will be forced to act more directly. However, I can at least confirm that House Ionati and House Emerald have declared neutrality in this conflict. I expected this from Uncle Oscar, but Aunt Sylvia? I was sure she would side with us. There is turmoil, intrigue, and deals that I am blind to. Our father held many secrets, and he shared precious few with me. As I stand now, I can't do anything. It is frustrating. We shall stand victorious, brother dearest. Uncle Cornelius will be defeated and we'll get our answers, Clara reassured her brother, the prince, before silence fell between them for several long, cold moments. Only the idle noises of the bridge crew members working at their stations echoed in the room, all orders and reports passing through the ship's network. She could access it, but there was nothing she could do to contribute. She had no military training, her strategic and tactical skills were lackluster, and her abilities in diplomacy were useless, as long as the enemy fleet refused to open any communications with them. I've given orders to deploy fighter squadrons. We shall deal with the battlecruiser while the fighters hunt down their ships to cripple them rather than destroy them, if at all possible, the prince suddenly announced. Admiral Damien, I leave my fleet under your command. Understood, my liege. May I ask, do you wish that vessel captured, crippled, or destroyed? The older man asked with respect. Has the vessel been identified yet? The prince asked in turn. Not yet, my liege. Signatures indicate that it is part of the third fleet, but nothing else is. Please ignore my previous statement, my prince, 
I have just received confirmation that the battlecruiser in question is the rightful path of House Kayston. It is most certainly commanded by a main bloodline of the Kayston family, perhaps by Andrew Kayston, the heir of the house. In that case, cripple the vessel and then order a boarding assault, the prince commanded. If we capture the heir of House Kayston, we may learn some of their secrets. It shall be done, your majesty, the admiral replied, before focusing his full attention on the coming battle. On the tactical display, Clara and Cynthia watched as two dozen tiny orbs formed around their fleet, each one representing a squadron of fighters. Like raindrops, they spread in several directions, all heading to the same objective. All they could do now was wait and see the battle play out. How I've missed this feeling. The training chambers are good, but nothing beats flying an actual ship. And I'm flying a line, Raptor fighter. Wham and Weskull won't believe it when I tell them. His cheery mood dropped as the faces of his brothers flashed before his eyes. That is, if I ever see them again. When was the last time I spoke to them? To mom and dad? Hell, when was the last time I sent them a message or got one in return? Two? Three years? I wonder how they're doing. He pondered for a few moments, then shook his head violently. No, don't think about them. They're safe and they're just middle-class commoners in an almost worthless dirt ball. Focus on the now, Wyatt he said to himself to rein in his wary thoughts and focus once more on the objective. It's not just your life on the line now, Wyatt. You're now responsible for four more, he muttered, regaining his composure and watching the display monitor with four names on it following a coded tagline. The first was Epsilon II, another Raptor fighter piloted by one ensign Gregor Undage. Epsilon III followed, piloted by warrant officer Leopold Dakar. Epsilon IV was next, piloted by Sub-Lieutenant Abacus Reed. The fourth life under his charge was Epsilon V, piloted by Ensign Noltar Okara. Meanwhile, he was Epsilon I, the leader of Epsilon Squadron. Commander Redford had thrust him into that position without much fanfare or warning, but for once he had some experience in that regard. Wyatt relaxed on his seat and rolled his shoulders, feeling the dampening suit that further allowed him to withstand high G-forces and movements that would render an inexperienced person unconscious. Or worse, within moments. It was tight but not distracting or obtrusive at all, but that was not the reason he rolled his shoulders. The reason was that he was no longer sore nor tired after enduring Cynthia's torture session barely an hour earlier. A chuckle escaped his throat. The Dulaxis implant works marvels. No wonder the richest nobles back in the academy always look so damn crisp and full of energy all the time, he muttered to himself before checking his tactical display. He and his three partner squadrons were still far away from their objective, a rundown corvette on the outer shell of the enemy formation. He could already see the few fighters the beast of a battlecruiser had at its disposal deploying, but were not moving to intercept any fighter squadron so far. They would wait within the protective umbrella of the ship's PD cannons and turrets before engaging the stragglers. Simple, but effective. He frowned at the display, seeing the fleets slowly moving and the prince's fleet peel a few ships, mainly frigates, two destroyers, and a light cruiser to start harassing the battlecruiser. Why are they even fighting? Are they just delaying us or do they have suicidal orders? What's their game? His thoughts were interrupted when his radio chimed in. Epsilon, Nu, and Omicron squadrons, this is Delta-1. Squadron leaders, report in. Epsilon-1 reporting, he replied almost instantly, hearing the other two reply shortly after one another. This is Nu-1 reporting. Omicron-1 here. Systems nominal. We have our orders. Cripple our objective and move in to assist where needed after that. This will be a cakewalk. Fly with honor and fight for the prince and the principality. Try not to get shot down, Delta-1 said. For the principality! Wyatt replied enthusiastically, feeling his blood pumping as the prospect of battle grew closer. In truth, he was afraid. Everything had shifted around his life so abruptly. Redford Kalin was the first noble that had ever given him the least modicum of respect. But not only that, he treated him fairly. Cynthia was in that same category, and he was sure that her training sessions, which would continue for as long as events permitted, were a result of his victory in the competition. Then there were the prince himself and his younger sister, Princess Clara Astor, who treated him like a person, not a mere commoner. Maybe that was their way of showing gratitude, but he didn't ponder it. 
It had been just a little over a standard week since that eventful cross of fate that turned his world upside down. There's no excuse for failure, he said to himself, muttering one of the military tenants he learned by heart. Computer, time before we enter the Corvette's PD range? 41 seconds and counting, the AI replied. Wyatt hummed deeply, thinking about which approach would be the most effective. He wasn't worried about the main weapons of the Corvette. The spinal-mounted railgun, heavy laser turrets, and the plasma cannons were meant to fight and destroy all sorts of enemies. Except for fighters, be they piloted or drones. Fighters lacked true firepower to stand alone against anything bigger than a poorly armored and armed freighter. The armor plating was there mainly to hold the ship itself together and protect from micro-impacts. The shields were enough to withstand a few shots, but were, as an instructor once put it, paper thin. And the weapons, while effective, couldn't do much damage on their own except for the tactical mine. But for each downside, there was an advantage too. The size of a fighter made it next to impossible for any ship bigger than another fighter or a bomber to target it with anything besides missiles and PD weapons. Then there was the speed and maneuverability it possessed, making missiles almost equally useless since a fighter could outrun them, destroy them, or avoid their detonation with ease. It took a particularly green pilot or a heavily damaged fighter to get taken down that way. Finally, stealth. As long as the fighter killed its engine, radars would not detect it. Only scanners would be able to pick up the metal alloys and electrical components that made up the vessel. And that was the beauty of a fighter in Wyatt's humble opinion. Alone, they represented no real danger, but in vast numbers, they were deadly to anything but the most heavily armored and shielded vessels. This meant that in the Principality, being the backwater that it was, precious few ships could stand up against a swarm of fighter squadrons, or so many believed. He was of a different take regarding the effectiveness of a single fighter. While he agreed that swarm tactics reigned supreme and were deadly, there was nothing more devastating than a single fighter or single squadron of them, making use of their advantages to the fullest of their potential could and had spelled the doom of heavyweight ships and stations in the past. Many fighters were a problem. A few or just one would be overlooked or ignored, and that was a deadly line of thought to have. Ten seconds for contact, the AI spoke. This is Epsilon-1. Engage standard formation. Lock your targets on the PD turrets, Wyatt ordered as he did the same. Locked. Acknowledged. Locked. Ready to fire. His squadron reported immediately. The second they crossed the effective range of the Corvette's PD range, it began to spew fire in all directions. But eight PD turrets were scant protection against 20 Raptor fighters. Volley! he ordered, and saw with satisfaction how his display was illuminated by two Hawk missiles being fired from each member of his squadron, joining the 30 other missiles of their fellow squadrons. The PD turrets changed targets, and counter-missiles were launched from their tubes in an effort to destroy the incoming barrage. Out of the 40 missiles fired, 17 were destroyed either by counter-detonations or successful hits from the turrets, but 13 hit their marks. Just like that, their shield flickered, eight effective PD turrets became five, their antenna was destroyed, and two small gaping holes were left on the hull of the Corvette. Measuring 800 meters long, 200 in width, and 150 in height, the ugly box-like ship refused to give up. Two fighters fell out of formation and were struck down by their turrets. Another was caught by a missile and was turned into slag, a fair trade-off by all measures so far. Epsilon Squadron cripple their engines while Delta Squadron does its work, Wyatt ordered, moving with his wing behind the Corvette. From his monitor and thanks to the external cameras, the several hundred kilometer distance between them and the ship was all but inconsequential as they quickly moved into effective range of their coil guns. Another three PD turrets were destroyed by New Squadron, followed shortly by the last two and the collapse of the ship's shields by Omicron Squadron. Virtually defenseless now, Wyatt and his squadron pounced at the chance until they were less than two kilometers away from the Corvette. There was no need to get any closer as they could just pepper the engines at a safe distance. So close that if he had a window, he would be able to see the ship with his naked eye. Maintain distance and focus fire on their engines. Cripple it, he commanded and squeezed the trigger. 
The rattling of the coil guns made his fighter vibrate, and he watched with satisfaction how a deluge of white-hot pieces of accelerated metal slammed against the side of the Corvette's engines, slowly chipping at it and ensuring an eventual tearing effect. Alert! Epsilon-4 is moving out of formation, the AI warned. Wyatt watched his tactical display and saw that, indeed, Epsilon-4 was moving in closer to the Corvette. Epsilon-4, return to formation immediately. What do you think you're doing? I can't stand it anymore. Taking orders from you is humiliating. Why would Commander Redford put you in charge of the squadron? I won't let a filthy commoner take the glory for this victory, Abacus Reed replied. Wyatt gritted his teeth. Return to formation, Epsilon-4. That's a direct order. Epsilon-4, Abacus Reed, return to formation immediately. Epsilon-4 has deactivated his transmitter, the AI informed him. What is that stupid idiot thinking? Take all the glory. What glory? Commander Redford is the one who will be taking any credit whatsoever from this. I'm hardly calling the shots here. Arrogant, lousy, stupid piece of... Wyatt's train of thought was cut short when he saw what was Abacus's plan to take all the glory for himself. Idiot! He shouted in rage and disbelief. All fighters, retreat! Clear off! Now! he shouted in a desperate attempt to prevent any major losses. Luckily for him, almost every other fighter listened and quickly turned away at max speed. Three seconds later, the explosion happened. Abacus Reed, in all his wisdom, had decided to take out the ship's engines in a single strike by using his tactical mine. The moment Wyatt saw that his mine was activated, he knew what was going to happen. The funny thing about the tactical mines was that they were pretty resistant to heat, to prevent any accidental triggers, enough to withstand the heat emanated from the fighter's engines or the thrusters of missiles. They were nasty and effective pieces of work and packed quite a punch after they were armed. So what happened when a mine was armed and thrown at a ship's active, roaring, hot plume spewing engines from less than 500 meters away? Fireworks. A huge explosion blinded the external cameras for a few seconds, but when it was over, the Corvette's engines were offline because half of them were missing. Alongside it, the signal from Epsilon-4 went red and silent. Two unfortunate fighters from New Squadron were also caught in the blast, unable to veer off in time despite his warning. Insufferable glory-seeking self-righteous blue bloods, Wyatt half screamed in pure anger, unable to vent his fury any other way. Taking a moment to assess the situation, he managed to suppress his fury in order to fulfill his role as squadron leader. Epsilon Squadron damage report, he ordered, opening the channel. Epsilon 5 reporting, no damage sustained, Lieutenant, came the shaky response from Noltar Okara. Epsilon 2 reporting, my computer indicates that my engine suffered minor damage due to shrapnel and will only operate at 80% efficiency, Gregor Undaj reported. Epsilon-3 reporting, systems ready and undamaged, Lieutenant, Leopold Dakar said, unable to hide the tremor in his voice. Wyatt sighed. Understood. Epsilon-2, return to base. You're still able to fight, but I won't risk any unforeseen malfunctions on your vessel. Understood, Lieutenant. Disengaging, Gregor Undage said, and soon Wyatt saw on his display that his fighter was peeling off and heading back to the exalted virtue the prince's cruiser and flagship of their fleet. This is Delta-1. Hairwire mines detonation in three, two, one. Wyatt heard him count, and a static haze washed over the cameras for a moment. The Corvette was dead in space, and the haywire mines ensured that they wouldn't be able to overload their reactor in an attempt to avoid boarding and capture. The objective has been successfully crippled. Head to the following coordinates. Understood. Epsilon Squadron shall move as... Wyatt was cut off when the sudden chime and alarm of missiles locking onto his ship rang inside his cockpit. Evasive maneuvers, he ordered before moving to do precisely that himself. Computer, who launched those missiles? Unknown point of origin, the AI replied. A sudden tremor of dread filled his heart and he snapped a growl. Computer, calculate the vector trails of the missiles and draw approximate points of origin he ordered as he weaved and turned, outrunning the two missiles chasing him. Thanks to his tactical display, he noticed that every fighter in his squadron and the other three had also been targeted and were doing their best to avoid the missiles. They moved and danced to an unheard tune and one by one, the missiles were destroyed. A volley of shots rained past his fighter's side and the two missiles were safely destroyed. 
Looking at his screen, he saw that Epsilon-5 had shot the missiles down. Thank you, Epsilon-5. I owe you one. No need, Lieutenant. Happy to help. Where did those missiles come from? Noltar Olkara asked. My computer is unable to find a point of origin. Everyone, order your computers to trace the vector trails of the missiles. If I'm right, then there's one of those black ships prowling the battlefield, the same kind that was hunting down the royal yacht, Wyatt replied. No need for that, Epsilon-1. I have a visual. Linking feed, New One said, and a moment later a small window on his video feed showed the inky black hull of the black ship that was only visible thanks to the barely noticeable plume of light behind it. Got visual confirmation, too. Omicron 3 chimed in, also sharing his video feed. A third one is present, Leopold said, adding a third window depicting the prowling predatory ships. Wyatt narrowed his eyes. The ships were identical to the one he faced before, but smaller. Much smaller than the Corvette class he first encountered. It was smaller than a frigate, but if it shared more than mere design with its larger counterpart, then it was bound to be powerful and highly technologically advanced. Their firepower would be limited by their size, but could prove deadly if they acted recklessly. As luck would have it, he was familiar with their weaknesses somewhat. Listen, everyone, those damn ships will be fast and highly maneuverable, but their hull and shields must be weak. We have to focus fire on them and, Wyatt ordered. You're not the leader of this wedge, commoner, Omicron One countered. We can discuss that later, Delta One interjected. He's the only one who's faced these ships before. He has veterancy, like it or not. Wyatt, what are your orders? Undeterred by the interruption, he answered. Screen those bastards. Pick your targets and stay on them. The closer we are to them, the weaker they'll be. Their strength comes from their stealth capabilities and surprise assaults. I was able to knock one much larger away using a compost container and blow it up on their faces. It caused enough damage for the crew to turn tail and run at the very least. Don't bother using the missiles. They won't lock onto their shit. They're firing again. Evasive maneuvers. After that, hunt those bastards down. Don't let them escape for the principality. For the principality. Wyatt then focused his attention on fulfilling his duty. Now, with more forewarning, he was able to dodge the missiles headed his way easier than before and intercept the pair heading for Leopold using one of his missiles in turn. Again, they avoided taking casualties and were now closing in to the black ships that, noticing they had been discovered, moved to try and make a run for it. But it was too late for them. If they were anything like the Corvette-class black ship, then these ships would also be capable of keeping up with the royal yacht in terms of speed and seemed to be armed with plenty of missiles despite their relatively small size. Clocking at 200 meters set them between being a patrol gunship and a frigate, but still maneuverable enough to outpace every damn ship in the Principality and dance around them with ease. The outer hull, whatever material it was made of, was delicate, but it prevented the ship from being locked from afar. All things considered, he couldn't help but admire Duke Draymore for getting his hands on such ships. But where did he get them from? I've never heard of stealth ships like that before, Wyatt muttered to himself as he closed into the nearest black ship. They were fast, yes, but they were still no match for a fighter set on hunting an enemy down. Once he was close enough to the ship, his computer confirmed that it had no dedicated PD defenses except for four coil gun turrets that proved to be ineffective against the small, nimble fighters. He watched as the black ship targeted by Omicron 3 exploded after being peppered by a barrage of coil gun fire. The second black ship didn't fare much better, and mere minutes later, it was dead in space, drifting aimlessly with its deck destroyed and venting atmosphere from multiple points. That only left the third and final black ship to deal with. Closing in on the objective, his two remaining teammates and he poured sustained fire on the ship's engines. It didn't take long for the plume to die out, followed by an explosion that all but tore the ship in half as the bullets punctured its reactor. Those can't be the only ones, Delta One said through the radio. Well done, Wyatt. Do you know how to detect them before they engage? No. I don't understand how their stealth systems work, but it is highly effective. How did Duke Draymore and his forces get a hold of vessels like that, and for what purpose? Wyatt questioned himself again, unable to come up with a logical answer, and trying to decipher what role, aside from pursuers and performing ambush tactics, those black ships could provide. 
Figures. An uneducated commoner can't be trusted with any leadership position, Omicron One replied. You can't even answer a trivial question decisively. I'd like to see you come up with an answer yourself, Tayo. New One joined the conversation. Isn't it obvious? That damnable traitor has no honor. Who else but a weakling and a backstabber would make use of shameful ships like these? Omicron One replied with not a single ounce of doubt in his statement. Wyatt felt like face-palming at the sheer absurdity of what he'd just heard. Victory cares not about honor, you high and mighty blue blood. Go ahead and fight with honor all you want, but you'll get dead before long and join that petulant idiot of a Bacchus sooner or later, he thought angrily. And at that moment lamented the loss of the two pilots that died due to Abacus's wounded pride. Be that as it may, the battle is still raging and we must move to our next objective. Delta One cut through before a fight could break out. Wait, I'm getting a report from Commander Redford. Oh, oh no. Another eight black ships were detected and engaged, including a cruiser class one. The pride of Axtal, Raging Absolution, and Justice Herald have been destroyed. Another two ships, the Front of Honor and the Peerless Glory, have been crippled. That damn cruiser class ship wreaked havoc on our formation. Six of the black ships were destroyed. The cruiser class and the surviving small one have managed to disengage and are running away. Goodness gracious, a cruiser shouldn't move that fast. Where did those come from? They were waiting for us. How could this happen? Wyatt was paying no attention to the discussion taking place as his mind connected the dots. The Kaston's fleet movements now made sense. They were drawing their fleet into an ideal ambush where those black ships were waiting. Expanding his tactical map, he saw that the original Kaston fleet, aside from the now heavily damaged battlecruiser, was either destroyed or crippled. Another dot vanished from his map. A destroyer had been struck down by the largest black ship as it retreated to safety. Computer, calculate that ship's possible vector route and destination. Calculating, the AI replied, and three seconds later it showed four possible routes, with the most likely being the one closest to his current location. Everyone, head to the marked location, half thrust and with minimal output. They want to play hide and seek, then so shall we, sharing possible paths and coordinates he said, sending the results from his computer with the rest of his comrades. Interesting. What do you have in mind, Epsilon One? Delta One asked. Epsilon, Nu, and Omicron squadrons still have our tactical mines. Eight tactical mines in total. We'll set a trap using the mines to block that vector, and we will lie in wait further out. If that cruiser-class ship heads to that vector, we should be able to cripple it or destroy it. We can't let that thing escape to hound us again if we can help it, Wyatt said and for once, none argued against him outright. A few seconds of silence later, a voice came through the speakers. And if the mines fail to take it out? Leopold asked. Then we'll use our remaining missiles. We won't be able to lock onto the ship, but we can set them on a predetermined course. Even if the mines fail to take the ship down, they will cause severe damage. The missiles will then either finish the job or ensure that ship won't be a problem in the future. Hopefully, Wyatt said, admitting that his plan was far from perfect, but desperate times called for desperate measures. And if the ship heads to another vector, Omicron One countered as the marker for the black ship blinked out. They were now blind to its movements and could only guess. Then our ambush will be for nothing and we return to base. The battle is already over and all we can do now is try and cripple that cruiser, Wyatt said. I have forwarded your plan to Commander Redford. He's giving us the green light to proceed. Delta One said. Using missiles as torpedoes? Setting up an ambush against a stealth cruiser using only fighters? You're insane, Wyatt. I'll take that as a compliment, Wyatt replied, portraying a confidence he lacked within himself. As he and the other 12 fighters moved to position, only a single thought crossed his mind. That those black ships were ready and waiting and that the Kaston fleet, lackluster as it was except for that battle cruiser, was more than ready to sacrifice itself was not a delaying action. It was meant to slow them down and inflict serious casualties. A third of their fleet was now gone and the survivors were being rescued as well as boarding actions were taken to gain as much information as possible from the high-ranking officers. Frowning, he pondered a dark thought. They were waiting for us. This wasn't just a preemptive measure. That battle cruiser and the number of black ships, there's no way Duke Draymore has that many ships at his disposal. So either he's capable of seeing the future, 
or there's a traitor in the fleet. <laughs> 